Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Sherry. It's great to have you with us, everyone. I'm Jane McCarthy. We're going to start with some breaking news right now. This is happening in Spokane Valley. Emergency crews are trying to get control over a structure fire there, and witnesses say it's burning at Dixon Iron and Metal Recycling Center. Yeah, that is located on the corner of Broadway Avenue and Fancher Road. You can see the big smoke uh, plumes of smoke coming from that area. We did send crews there, and we'll have more as more information becomes available. Available. You'll see it right here on CREM2 and, of course, on CREM.com. Well, the U.S. Pavilion at Riverfront Park has been under construction for quite some time, but crews are almost done. Mm -hmm. Taking a live look down at the park. Do we have that live look at the park? There it is. There well, we we've go. got those big construction uh, trailers that are down there. Yeah. And you and I and Mark were down there just recently. And uh, we saw huge areas of, uh, of mounds of dirt. Right. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's a lot of work being done there, but I guess it's going to be wrapping up pretty soon. Yeah, they're plugging along. Creme Cheese Amanda Rolly shares how things are going and then also shows us which iconic structure is making a big comeback. Oh. Completion for the U.S. Pavilion and event space is expected for this fall. Today, we got to take another look at how construction is going. 18,000 square foot of flexible space that will be able to house our stage, floor seating, and then also other events and have those utilities to have this nice flexible area on the, uh, the ground surface. So when you look at events like 4th of July, whether it's red, white, and blue, or events like Hoop Fest, if we want to make it look like a basketball, or other, we have that capability in the future. So when you see the, the tallest point at the top, uh, somebody with disabilities, families, strollers will be able to access that. and then having accessibility from the bridge up to the pavilion site is something we lacked in the past and we're now able to have that. Here at the north end of the promenade, which stretches from the Blue Bridge all the way out to the North Bank Playground, that's expected to wrap up with construction by late summer to early fall. Now this space could be used for pig out in the park because here they've added another set of power supply, just like the Orange Bridge. Our team was able to refurbish that and we'll be able to recover it with the lilac color, so the wings will be lilac on the north bank. And to its original design, we'll be able to move and be able to lift and rotate with the wind. All right, well, a little wet out there at Riverfront Park and uh, some rain showers today. Are we going to see more of the same? Yeah, we've got rain developing at times. You're going to see showers at times this evening as well as overnight. Come with me right now, folks. We'll show you uh, what we've got going on here with a little uh, the Doppler radar display. Lots of rain pretty much from I-90 to the south, as you can see. Uh, and even some isolated thunderstorms are working their way uh, up into areas of uh, northern Oregon. But again, still south of the Washington border. Here's a closer view. And again, we've got a little bit of light rain here locally, kind of spotty showers, uh, but the heaviest rain again all down where you see the darker shades of green. This is in the lower Columbia Basin right there. Uh, we'll continue to see this shower activity at times this evening. A few showers overnight. Could see even some showers with... Uh, <coughs> Well, there you go, folks. Thank you so much. Well, I think there was a little dust in the air <laughs> and with all that construction down at Riverfront Park. Uh, anyway, some showers at times tomorrow. Could see some afternoon thunderstorms. We'll look for a daytime high of 56 degrees, so seasonal temperatures. I always look ahead to the weekend. I've got mostly cloudy skies on Saturday, and then rain developing Saturday night into Sunday. Daytime highs uh, almost normal, maybe a, a few degrees above average. We'll go 57 on Saturday, 58 degrees expected on your Sunday. All right, Tom. Bless you and thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, turning our attention now to the nation's capital, where two top Trump administration officials are resigning. Whitney Ward joins us from the newsroom with more on what prompted the moves. That's right. Good afternoon, both of you. The main takeaway here, of course, is for two key positions, the director of the Secret Service and the secretary of Homeland Security, both now leaving the administration. It's all part of a massive overhaul of Homeland Security that is reportedly being engineered by Stephen Miller, who is one of the president's top advisors. So the decision to replace Randolph Tex Alice was apparently made about two weeks ago, which interestingly is even before that incident where a woman made it past several levels of security at 
at Mar-a-Lago. And even after that happened, President Trump said he couldn't be happier with the Secret Service. So this resignation comes kind of as a surprise to a lot of people. As for Kirsten Nielsen, the president, the president did make a comment on Friday that changes could be coming. We may be going in a different, you'll be seeing very soon, we may be going in a different direction. So President Trump has repeatedly expressed frustration with the flow of migrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border and his top officials' inability to fix the matter. Nielsen, now the 12th cabinet member to leave the Trump administration during his time in office, Customs and Border Protection Commissioner Kevin McCallanan will now take over as the acting head of Homeland Security. Tom, Jane, back to you. Whitney, thank you very much for that update. Ocean tides could someday serve as a major source of renewable energy. First, scientists want to understand, though, how underwater mm -hmm. equipment might affect the behavior of fish. It's pretty exciting technology mm -hmm. they're working with. The scientists at Again, Western sorry. Washington recently released black cod into Swim Bay. What they're doing is testing to see how the fish react to the technology. The fish are attached with tags that trigger sensors underwater, and then those sensors will report data back to the scientists. Researchers say testing is a big part in knowing how this uh, wave technology will affect the health of marine life. Be disturbed by the device, either from the sound or just by the fact that it's in their habitat and they don't know what it is. Um, and if we don't monitor this to check it, we won't be able to tell. People are very concerned about the health of these animals and they don't want to see uh, new machinery, new things in, in, you know, put into their environment without uh, a method in place to observe how those things are going to have an effect on those animals. Sounds fair. Once <laughs> this initial study is complete, the scientists may redo the experiment with real underwater turbines. Interesting. Well, more than 750 scientists and fisheries experts from Washington and Oregon are in Tacoma right now for the Salmon Recovery Conference. It marks the 20th anniversary of the Salmon Recovery Act, credited with saving several salmon species, and that includes Columbia River steelhead and Chinook salmon. The conference runs through tomorrow at the Tacoma Convention Center. Well, there is a video on Facebook, and it's getting a lot of attention in Idaho, and it's also raising a lot of questions. Yeah, Mark Hanrahan joins us in the studio with more on that. Mark. Yes, good afternoon, guys. A woman in St. Mary's, Idaho, has spotted the same deer in her backyard a few times now, and she recently captured it on video. So it's a little difficult to see, but the deer's neck is twisted in a way that pushes its head down toward the ground. People commenting on the video weren't sure what to make of it, so we showed that video to an expert with Idaho Fish and Game to get their opinion. So coming up in our next half hour, we try to get to the bottom of this strange condition and find out if it's a popular occurrence in that area. Jane and Tom, I'm flashing, so I'll send it back to you. You're strobing there, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you plan on visiting Yellowstone National Park, you could run into a new thermal area. Scientists think it has been growing for the past two decades. Now, the new area is deep in Yellowstone's backcountry near West Turn Lake. Geologists with the USGS say this is typical hydrothermal behavior. A thermal area is the result of Earth's magma activity underground, and it includes geysers like Old Faithful oh, yeah. and Hot Springs, too. Yellowstone has about 10,000 thermal areas. This new area is proof that more keep forming. So any geological changes at Yellowstone tend to make visitors you know, pretty uneasy for <laughs> obvious reasons. Well, since the park sits on an underground super volcano, However, scientists with the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory say there's nothing to worry about yet. That supervolcano has not erupted for 630,000 years. Of course, it's not telling us when it's going to right. erupt again, so there's that. <laughs> we'll update you. Yes. <laughs> well, Spokane astronaut Anne McLean just completed another spacewalk. During the successful replacement of the battery charge discharge unit, uh, ground controllers removed that failed battery from the integrated electronics. Well, McLean and a fellow astronaut made upgrades to the International Space Station earlier today. If you look closely, you can see McLean. She's the one wearing the spacesuit with the red stripes there. Gosh, it almost looks like it's from a movie. Mm -hmm. uh, they repaired a robotic arm and then they installed cables for better wireless communications. Now the mission was expected to take six and a half hours. Well, they completed the mission in six hours and 29 minutes for the win.